In this project, we will be examining the different factors and aspects of Germany's colonization and imperialization of Africa. And this is by Ava Irwin, Noah Wallen, Coltrane Margosian, and Ivy Spell. Starting off strong, these are the most prominent justifications of Germany's imperialism that were exemplified in their occupation of Africa. A lot of these factors are interconnected with each other, and we will examine them individually as well, while we dissect multiple primary sources that clearly demonstrate these important ideologies used by Germany to justify their imperialism. This is a passage from a book called Does Germany Need Colonies by Friedrich Fabry that identifies motives for European imperialism. This is quite a long passage, but essentially the bottom line is that Fabry is detailing why Germany should be imperializing. He explains that the Industrial Revolution elevated the demand for natural resources and materials from other parts of the world. An extremely important resource for the Germans was iron and steel, which were especially found in the parts of Africa that they colonized. These resources were desired because of Germany's goal to improve and build up their military. And if you remember from before, we talked about how Germany's main idea of real politic was that they were a country of blood and iron, which only further supports the idea that Germany truly aspired to industrialize further and increase their militaristic powers around the world. The speech containing this phrase was made by Otto von Bismarck in 1862, so only a little bit before this article was published, fueling imperialism in Germany because of these same values. This article also supports the idea that Germany wanted to imperialize to strengthen their economy by opening more business enterprises and markets over a larger area in the world. It's interesting because this passage focuses a lot on the nationalism that Germany wanted to build up to strengthen and consolidate their power over a larger empire, as well as the fact that a huge justification was that they wanted to prevent other countries from gaining more land than they already had. And by countries, we mean Britain and France, who were major rivals of Germany in this game of industrializing, imperializing, and gaining more status in the world. This is huge because it proves social Darwinism big time, as it is essentially alluding to the idea that Germany cared the most about being superior in their rule ac across the world, their economy, their military, and their overall power because of all of these factors. All right, so this is one of the articles that was written and decided on during the Berlin Conference of 1884 and 1885, when the partitioning of Africa and other rules, other rules for those who occupied Africa were decided. This entire article is really important and I highly recommend checking out the whole transcript of the conference because it explains a lot about the mentalities of European countries as they imperialized and ruled Africa. But for the sake of specifically Germany's ideologies when moving into Africa, I just want to look at this one line. In order to give a new guarantee of security to trade and industry and to encourage by the maintenance of peace, the development of civilization in the countries mentioned in Article 1. This line exemplifies Germany's use of the idea of white man's burden. It quite literally states that European countries, especially Germany, imperialized and colonized Africa to develop the civilizations of African countries as they benefited from the new African colonies aid in increasing industrialization and trade. So while this is not specifically a picture showing Germany's rule in Africa, it is a mirrored example of the way that European countries wish to take control of native barbarian populations to develop and industrialize them as prosperous colonies. This was achieved through violent actions as shown in this photograph. And a perfect example, example of this is demonstrated in Germany's actions after the Herrera revolt of 1904, which took place in German Southwest Africa. Basically, the Herero and Nama people rose up against Germany, but what matters more is the result of this rebellion. Germany won against the natives, but they were frankly quite annoyed and done with the natives, subsequently cracking down and really starting to display their strength and rigidness. A mass genocide by systematic extermination of the native people occurred that was fueled by and built upon a basis of, na of nationalism, racism, and economic and political prospects. All right, next we have a couple of political cartoons to support these justifications, which I will dissect individually. 
starting with the Rhodes Colossus. This is a primary example of the way Europeans claimed different portions of Africa and staked claim on each one. Notice the man's feet that are widely spread across the continent of Africa, which is important to note appears quite small within standing above, but his feet are also firmly planted on either side. He's holding strings that are attached to the different parts of Africa as well. And this overall, and overall, this cartoon portrays the utter control that Germany and other nations exercised over the countries of Africa. And for Germany specifically, their control over multiple parts of Africa was due to their, to their resolve to not be left behind in the process of imperializing that many European nations took part in. This political cartoon is yet another super famous one that you've probably seen multiple times. It doesn't have a known name, but it's often referred to as the Berlin Conference political cartoon or the Scramble for Africa cartoon, and it really demonstrates both. First of all, this most prominent figure in the cartoon is supposed to be Otto von Bismarck, as he is cutting up the cake that symbolizes Africa into pieces. It's important to note that these slices in the cartoon are not equal. Some pieces are larger and some are smaller. Likewise, Africa was divided into sections for, for the different countries of Europe, but not equally. There was such a demand for African countries because of their natural resources and general appeal as land, which remember was the equivalent of power to empires like those of the European nations, that it took a long time to divide up Africa. And even then, different European nations had different amounts of Africa under their control by the end of the Berlin Conference. Shown here is an animated map of Germany's colonial expansion throughout Africa. Germany's first contact with what is now Namibia was when London Missionary Society transferred its efforts in the area to the German Rhenish Missionary Society. Churches were promptly built throughout by Germans, expanding their reach. German Southwest Africa was formally founded in 1884 at a request of merchant Adolf Luderitz. Germany consolidated power in the land through diplomacy in Berlin Conference to Europeans and through violence with the Herero and Namakua genocides and natives. Germans had made trading posts in Cameroon as early as 1868 by private companies, which then expanded to plantations which took up more land. Cameroon was declared an Imperial German territory in 1884, petitioned by Adolf Wohrmann. The now official colony was protected by German soldiers who had silenced naval uprisings. Togoland was first settled in for farm exports, such as cotton and coffee, and was made official with a signature from a native chief in 1884. Germans consolidated for power and expanded through roads, railroads, and police officers who would attack any resistors. The German East Africa Company was founded in 1884 to organize and protect its title colony. The company gained control through treaties with native leaders, who were forced to through military or not. Any people or groups who resisted German rule would be killed, leaving many with no other choice due to their inferior technology. The present-day countries of Namibia, Cameroon, Togo, Tanzania, Burundi, and Rwanda before their introduction to Germans were largely ruled by many independent tribes. When Germans started taking control of these territories, in German West Africa they came for missionary purposes. In Cameroon they came to create trading posts. In Togoland they came for farmland and crops. And in German East Africa they came for control of the slave trade. All four of these colonies gained power in the area through construction, immigration, and military intervention. Once the colonies were firmly established, they were largely controlled through direct rule. Governors and administrators would be sent from Germany to directly rule, although they would often employ native to work for different jobs such as tax collection. This direct rule was likely their only option, as most German colonies were simply not profitable enough to be self-sustainable, meaning they had to have direct input from Germany in order to keep them from falling apart. The political cartoon Darkest Africa by Marcus Edwin depicts the spread of unrest throughout Africa due to Western colonization. During the scramble for Africa, European countries tried to gain control of as much of Africa as they could through colonization. In a statement to the UN Fourth Committee in 1956, Julius Nair, a Tanzanian anti-colonial activist, opposed the idea of the white man's burden that had been so prevalent in European society. 
He explained that the people did not feel the need to be governed or civilized by the white man, and so they rebelled. The Maji Maji Rebellion was a rebellion against German colonization in German East Africa, what is now known as Tanzania, caused by a German policy intending to force the indigenous population into growing cotton. Because the Germans had a relatively weaker hold in the colonies compared to other European countries, they resorted to the use of violent tactics to maintain control. The rebellion began when Kinzutao Nguale claimed to have been possessed by the snake spirit Hongo, and declared that the people of Tanzania were destined to drive out the, Germ the Germans out of Africa. He claimed to have obtained sacred water, also known as Maji Maji, which was said to have the ability to repel German bullets. German missionaries migrated to Africa in order to spread Christianity. They viewed indigenous tribal practices as savage and barbaric, and so they thought to civilize these people by introducing them to Christianity. By doing this, they destroyed the indigenous people's old way of life and severed them from their traditions. This religious dissent led to uprisings and rebellions across Africa, and eventually led to the independence of Western Africa in 1961. Okay, guys, so you, as you can see here, these are the natural resources of Africa. And in this map on your right, you can see German colonization and where we are currently stationed at this time period. As you saw earlier in Coltrane's map, um, this does change. We do kind of move around a lot. Boundaries do move. For example, in a map that I'll show you in a minute, we are somewhere completely different than we are right now, but still in the relative vicinity. So, as you can see, in the relative vicinity and in where we are, we have a lot of coal and gold and iron and oil and all of that good stuff that we need for trading and for colonies. So, this is a great, great, great area to set up colonies, which is why the scramble for Africa was such a big deal as Noah stated earlier, because there were so many good resources here. Oops, sorry. Okay, now as you can see, here's the next map. And as you can see, we definitely shifted a little bit. This is Germany right here. So we definitely did shift a little bit and gain more territory as time went on and lose some in some cases, but relatively we stay the same. As you can see over there, it's iron is FE. And so we have a lot of good iron sources here, 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 which is all where we are. So iron is definitely going to be very important to Germany. So a family that was directly impacted by this iron franchise was August Thyssen. He was a self-made millionaire and he was born to a poor family. So he was a very respectable man because in Germany at the time, there were very, very few rich families. And the fact that he was a self-made millionaire and not passed down from generations and generations of wealth is very, very impressive and very respectable. He, in his early 20s, had bought a rolling mill and established a firm. This is more than most 20-year-olds do in our day and age today, and resources are very limited back then, especially in Africa. So again, very, very incredible work. He had employed 50,000 workers by World War I, and he was producing millions of tons of steel and iron a year. So that directly Im was impacted by the iron sources. In 1890, the Bessemer process was gradually supplanted by open heart steel making by the middle of the 20th century and was no longer in use. So this again goes on the process of iron. It was mined and then it was used to make pig iron, but 
that iron commodity was what was needed around the world and we had the raw iron. So this is the path on which it's going. And iron production was a particularly important pre-colonial African technology. And with iron becoming a central component of socioeconomic life in many societies across the continent, it was very, very important and had definitely established itself as a stronghold in our society. So iron was not only used for exporting and for trading, it was also very, very important for the first revolution, um, industrial revolution, and that was in the steam engine. The first industrial revolution was the industry, it was the revolution of coal and of steam powered items. So the advancement of the steam engine directly improved the efficiency of coal mining during the Industrial Revolution, which was our second biggest export. So the first greatest export is directly impacting the efficiency and amount that the second greatest export is being able to be produced, which is very, very, very important and it made coal cheaper, more abundant, and an easily available source of energy. Now, colonies back then were really good for, coastal colonies were really, really good for big ships from their mother country to come, stop, like pick up goods, drop off goods, and then continue on its way. Because ships back then were powered by coal and steam engine. So they were able to come and pick up more coal and refuel their ships so they could carry more goods instead of having to carry more boxes of coal. Very, very revolutionary, very, very important. Iron was not only important then, but it was also a very important component of construction methods and architecture. Um, these methods used iron to provide far stronger and taller structures with less expenditure of materials than stone brick or wood and it was more sturdy it was safer it was cheaper it was all around better for everyone it lasted longer so this is just another shoot up in an advancement of technology and an advancement of industrialization most African peoples had been using metals for a long time. Gold and copper had been used in Dubai and Egypt since around 4000 BC. And they are not very strong metals. As you know, if you have just the closer to 100% gold you have in a object of jewelry, you notice the more bendy, the more uh, moldable it becomes. It is not a very strong metal. However, iron is a very, very strong metal. And because of this, they were able to create stronger tools to do stronger work, to create more product and more exploration and more industrialization. So this is very, very important. The use of iron gave people power to govern the natural environment. So this also not only directly impacted architecture, but also directly impacted agriculture. Iron was traded for an array of goods, but mostly iron was traded for slaves in the era of the transatlantic slave trade. Many were eye-catching consumer goods. Others were far more mundane, including voyage iron, as you can see right here from this source. Oops, sorry about that. Iron was also used for steam engines as well, as we mentioned previously, and the coal was very important. All right, so I bring us back to the map because I wanted to, again, show you all of this iron and try to show you in more detail and now that I have uh, explained myself a little better. Now this map may become a little more relevant and a little more easy to understand. 
Okay, so as you can come over here and see Germany, we see it's pretty low compared to everywhere else, but you know, around average. We start to, we shoot up right here actually, and then, you know, it falls a little bit, but it's still rel it, an upward trajectory. And then we shoot down right over here. And as you can see, this is the highest it was ever been. And that was directly around the time that that, oops, that, that very rich family was in their full power. Now, as you can see, it shoots down over here. And this is because if you look at the time frame, that is the exact years of World War I. So people, less people are being employed and more people are being put into armies. And then we shoot up to the highest it was ever. And this is because after World War I, people needed jobs, people needed resources, countries needed resources. This is very important. And then we come back down again, but that's natural because, you know, we had, we're about to go into World War II. And this graph shows before these, this chart begins to come. So around this time period, it explains it a bit better. As you can see, we're down, 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 and then we eventually just all of a sudden shoot up. And this is around the time that Germany is actually being able to export goods from Africa. So moving into 6.5 here, we know that Germany definitely built their colonies and their empire on the backs of Native Americans and African Americans and so many more. And what happened was, Germany pranced in and tried to give an agreement with to a local chief tribe and the chief was not dumb and it was a very um a very one-sided agreement in this treaty and so the le local chiefs did not party to the treaty and the Germans attacked their village and tore down flags. Unfortunately for the African Americans and Native Americans and the people, the inhabitants of those towns, um, it was, it was not good for them. I don't prefer to go into more detail, but if you do want to know specifics, I recommend checking out this link right here. Germany also exported the native peoples from their homes and sold them in the Atlantic slave trade, like we said earlier, and traded them for iron. Colonialism distorted African pattern of economic de development in many different ways. There was disregard dysregulation of production of goods markets traders transports provision of social amenities and pattern of urbanization etc uh it does still directly affect africa today and if you are interested in that i do highly recommend checking out this link this article was very interesting some of the problems that african-american countries experience up to this day are a direct result of the negative impacts of colonialism as they did before. And again, this is also a very interesting link. So this is what the, uh, oops, sorry. This is exactly the iron that they were mining up is right here. And then we would have to make it into pig iron through that process that I stated earlier. Now this is a direct primary source. As you can see here, we have four African-American boys carting around this German superior in what looks to be a hammock throne thing. And it is basically, they're carting him around and telling everyone else, hey, look, we're German, we're better than you. And so that was another direct negative impact on those people. 
Initially, a large number of people immigrating to German colonies in Africa were missionaries sent to spread Christianity, if only to establish German influence in the continent. These missionaries were often affiliated with a Rhenish missionary society or a North German missionary society and would study for them. Travel by boat was by far the most common method of intercontinental travel at the time, so colonial settlers and missionaries would be sent to the African settlements through such medium. Picture in this image is a Protestant missionary school located in Togoland, arguably the most successful German colony, which would attract settlers. Missionaries would be paid by the German government to spread Christianity and German influence, but they'd also get a moral boost due to the spread of the word of God. With an African society, missionaries would do all they could to spread their religion to the native Africans, displaying their devotion to both their country and God. Berlin Missionary Society, also known as the Society for the Advancement of the Evangelistic Missions Among the Heathen, was a German Protestant Christian missionary society which sent missionaries to German colonies in Africa with the intent of spreading Christianity and civilizing the indigenous populace. A majority of the missionaries were from Prussian descent. The diary entries of Otto Poselt, a German missionary, detail the experience of missionaries in Africa. The missionaries built houses, schools, and churches under difficult weather conditions and suffered financially due to droughts, the influx of locusts, and cattle diseases. He and his wife eventually migrated to Brazil after she had a nervous breakdown, which prompted him to resign from the Berlin Missionary Society. This is Otto Poselt, and this is the German Missionary Society. This is a great primary source that was written in 1916 and basically covers the growth of Germany across a huge time period, from like the 1500s with their connections to the Hanseatic League, all the way to 1915. This source is a pretty long one, but it covers both the idea that Germany's industrialization led to expansions overseas, expanding the empire and establishing more, more colonies and transoceanic relationships, as well as the idea that as a result of Germany's transoceanic empire, migration patterns changed dramatically, and migration itself increased significantly. To elaborate, the source begins with stating that German economists did not agree with the thought of colonization. In fact, they outright deny the possibility that colonies would benefit the country's economy. As they believe that the increase in migration as Germans moved to new colonies will cause a huge dip in the economy. This even alludes to the previously mentioned idea of white man's burden, as it talks about the benefits of Germans being able to spread the customs and traditions known as, known as Deutschstum or Germanism. Now, in the second paragraph, economists began to recognize the importance of migration and colonization of other areas in the world. As Germany extended their length of rule overseas and established prosperous colonies within, with German customs and ideals, they were able to open new markets, improve their knowledge of navigation, as well as increase their boon that spawned for more extensive navigation, and overall just literally bring a lot more money into Germany. It's also explained in the last paragraph that through migration, the growth of Germany and their surplus populations were able to be stabilized while still benefiting the, con the country, which consequently led to huge raises in the rates of migration to German colonies. The economic rewards from this important endeavor transformed the Germany of other days from an agricultural and forest covered country into a formidable industrial, commercial, and maritime nation, as directly quoted from the last paragraph. And I think that pretty perfectly ties in every element we talked about and presented before to show you how Germany really exemplified an industrializing, imperializing, and colonizing country whose actions as said country resulted in a surge of nationalism and major increases in their economy.